Howdy, my name is Joe Barnard, and I run a YouTube channel called BPS Space, where we build model rockets, and sometimes the rockets work. Most of these designs center around 3D printing plastics, but as the rockets get larger, the tolerances get a little tighter, which is why I'm excited to be partnering with Tormach and upgrading my capability with their PCNC 440 mil. I've had a small desktop mill for a while, and while it's good at what it does, what it does is soft materials in a relatively small work area. So when I started looking at CNC mills this winter, material compatibility and a good work area were at the top of my list. The 440 immediately stood out as a tool that I could get started with quickly and also grow into over time. I haven't used a large CNC mill before. I don't have any prior machining experience like this. So something that I could get started with quickly and then grow into over time was really important. Shamelessly, I'm also kind of an impatient engineer. A lot of my designs are centered around how fast I can make a part rather than whether it's optimized for everything. So speaking of speed, why don't we talk about the process of going from having no machine to getting this thing up and running. The mill and tooling arrived in a few pallets earlier this year, and I was a little concerned about how that process would go because I've never received a shipment this large, but it was pretty straightforward. I will say that if you're getting one of these yourself, you want some decent space to set it up in. Once it's set up, the mill itself has a footprint that could fit in most rooms of a house, but setting it up in a garage made the setup process a lot more comfy. I started with the stand base, which goes together pretty easily. Each screw in the stand gets a little bit of Loctite before going in. The machine is gonna be moving around a lot, so you wanna make sure these screws can't back themselves out. The stand is all made of steel, and once it's together, it ends up being fairly rigid. The 440 also came with adjustable foot pads, and as you will see in a bit, those are critically important. I did all of this assembly on top of a tarp so I wouldn't scratch any parts, and once the stand was complete, it was time to make a few decisions. The mill itself weighs hundreds of pounds, so once it's on the stand, moving it around is a little bit of a process. So when you place the stand, you're pretty much placing the entire mill where you want it. As I mentioned, because of its size, the mill can go pretty much anywhere, but keeping it in the garage gives me easy access to all sides of the machine, and it keeps the rest of my place mostly free of chips. I checked clearances by using the chip tray from the mill enclosure and then set out to mount the mill. This process requires an engine hoist and a little bit of experimentation. When you place the mill, it gets bolted down at four points on the chip tray into the stand. And the tricky part of this is that when the mill is lifted, it's at an angle. So getting all of these objects to line up takes a little forethought. This is a process that's probably a lot easier with two people, but I'm one person and kind of stubborn, so I came up with a different idea. I ended up using a bunch of trigger clamps to hold the chip tray directly to the stand base, at least horizontally. Horizontally. Then I set the mill down on top of that. I mentioned the critical adjusting foot pads, by the way, and those came in handy because my engine hoist couldn't quite fit under the mill stand, so I used the foot pads to lift it up and get those, like, feet of the engine hoist under there. Once the mill was in place, I secured it with all four bolts, then got started on the enclosure. Much like the stand, the enclosure is made of steel sheets with some acrylic panels. Because of this, it's best to secure everything in place loosely first, then you can tighten down the screws once the enclosure parts are all in place. Now, just to be clear, the machine does not come with any lighting, but I really like going overboard with LEDs, and I've seen a few other people put LEDs in their 440 as well. Plus, I had a few extra LEDs from the Christmas tree I flew last year, so I figured I'd put them to good use. I took two of these LED strips and lined the inside of the machine. It does mean that you can have some crazy party modes, but for the most part, it just keeps things looking good for filming, which brings me to my next point. When cutting metals, the buildup of heat is a really big problem. Any machinist will know this. There are several options for types of coolant that you can use on the 440, and I opted for a Mr. Coolant using the Fog Buster. The reasoning here is twofold. While mist coolant isn't quite as effective as flood coolant at cooling parts, it's better for filming machining videos, and more importantly, it's better for the type of use that my mill is going to see. Because I'm a hobbyist instead of a full-time machine shop, this machine is going to see intermittent use, which means there might be periods where for a week or two, I'm doing nothing but making parts, and then I have a few weeks of downtime while I'm working on other parts of the rockets. Flood coolant can get kind of gross if it sits idle for long periods of time, and I don't mind going a little slower on my parts while using a slightly less effective coolant, so that's why I chose the Mister. The next step in the setup process was getting the machine wired up. The machine has all its motor controllers and electronics pre-wired in the back cabinet, then the computer that tells them what to do is this little box which runs a software called PathPilot. PathPilot is a CNC controller software, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The PathPilot controller connects to the machine through a pretty beefy cable, and all the other peripherals, like the mouse, keyboard, and screen, connect to the controller. 
An older version of Pathpilot did come pre-installed on the controller, but as soon as I connected to the internet, it found a newer version and updated. Very little calibration was needed to get things running on the machine, but before I could start making parts, there were a few more steps. First, I cleaned the packing grease off of the build table with acetone, then I coated the table in a small amount of anti-corrosion spray. Rust isn't a huge problem where I live out in California because the air is so dry, but taking care of your tools is important and coating them and protecting them against rust is a good idea. After this, I installed the Tormach cover plate over one of the drive motors, along with the front cover that protects the limit switches. The next step here was installing the power drawbar. I don't need anything fancy like the automatic tool changer because I'm not counting cycle times on thousands of Parts. That said, the power drawbar does speed up tool changes a lot, so it feels like a great addition for this machine. Like most of the parts, installation was fairly straightforward with clear instructions provided on the Tormach site and this YouTube channel. The drawbar works off of a 100 PSI air supply, which can also be used for the fog buster mist coolant and just for clearing chips in general. And that brings us to tooling. I got an assortment of flat and ball end mills to start with some basic parts and then got them all set up in Tormach TTS holders, which makes them easy to swap in and out. This will be obvious for folks who have done CNC machining before, but it was a new thing for me Measuring your tools, getting your tool lengths, is a really important part of this process. I haven't had any major crashes with the machine so far, but I have had a few oopsies where I've used the wrong tool length or something has gotten out of calibration there. I also got set up with a few special tools, one of which is the Tormach Superfly, which leaves this beautiful surface finish and has an awesome sound. Additionally, the Diamond Drag Engraver has made making serial number and version numbers on parts really straightforward. And that gets us up to speed on actually building the machine. Now let's talk about using it. I lopped off quite a bit of stock material while I was dialing in feeds and speeds that I wanted to use for each tool. And I used these values to set up some templates in my CAM software. Speaking of tool paths and feeds and speeds, one of the best features that I have found on this machine so far is through Pathpilot, and it's called conversational milling. There are plenty of milling operations which are simple enough Enough that you don't need to generate them from CAD or use some fancy CAM software. Maybe you just need to face off a part, create a pocket, and make a few drills. Conversational milling in Pathpilot lets you generate that G-code on the machine right on the Pathpilot controller. And when dialing in feeds and speeds for each tool, that sped up the process a whole lot. The conversational milling tab also tries to generate feeds and speeds for you. Now, it's clear it doesn't recommend using those feeds and speeds just directly willy-nilly, but it's a really good jumping off point. One thing you'll notice in some of these shots is how thick the Fogbuster coolant is. You might think that's because I'm using some very fancy coolant solution, and unfortunately it's not. It's because I did not read the instructions. It turns out that the Fogbuster coolant I use has to be diluted before you use that, and I just didn't know that, so it took me a minute to figure that out. Since then, I've been making parts for my own rockets and a few spare parts for friends, and it has been a really straightforward machine to use. As I mentioned, this is my first time using a large CNC mill. I don't have a background in a machine shop, I'm just a hobbyist trying to figure things out. And honestly, the process was a lot more friendly than I thought it would be. I've still got a few hiccups to work out in generating tool paths. That turns out to be a skill that you just have to learn over time. And I've made some few uh, very silly mistakes uh, so far, but the machine has handled them like a champ. And that just about brings us up to speed on the machine and the parts I've made and how it's gone so far. If you want information on this machine, on Tormach in general, this is the channel for you. There are plenty of videos here and also links in the description down below where you can learn more about the 440 and the other stuff that Tormach makes. As well, if you'd like to follow along with the stuff that I build, there's a link to my channel in the description down below if high precision rocket parts are your thing. Thing. So thank you very much for watching and thanks to Tormach for partnering with creators and providing them with some incredible tools to help make their visions a reality. Anyway, that's all from me and happy milling.